Good morning again. If you've got your Bibles, we are going to be in the book of Job. We started a new series last week in Job. Started in chapter 1. Verse 1 is all we got done last week. We're going to try to do a few more verses this week than one. But uh, anyway, if you are joining us for the first time, we're glad to have you here today. Or if this is your first part of the Job series, we would encourage you to go watch last week's uh, message as well. We're going to touch on that briefly today as we... Uh, continue on to verse 2. But uh, <clears throat> we're going to be looking at Job's life and a part of Job's life that quite honestly I've, I've never really seen or heard anybody else consider. I'm not saying I'm the first one to ever do it. I'm sure somebody has. But uh, this isn't a real pop popular part of, of Job's story. And to be honest with you, it's not a part of his story that I've ever really seriously considered or examined <clears throat> myself before either. And I wasn't planning on examining it in this sermon series, but this week as I was preparing, the Lord just kept bringing me back to this section of the scripture. And, and um, I just, he just wouldn't leave me alone. As you can probably tell, looking at your outline, uh, we have a lot of blanks to fill in today. The Lord just could not leave me alone on this. And so what we're going to really be looking at today is, is the kind of father that Job was to his kids. And and we're going to look at the faithfulness of this man to his family. Um, I, I want to just say a couple of things here right on the top. Man, I am, this sermon is not about my kids, okay? I want you to know that. Um, it's tough to be a pastor's kid. There are a lot of expectations on the lives of, of any minister's children. Um, as one of my kids and I had discussions about just this week, um, it, it can be really tough. And uh, I'm so grateful and thankful as I know Abby is, for the kids the Lord has blessed us with. They are not perfect kids, but we are so blessed by them and so blessed by their faithfulness and desire to follow the Lord. They are leaps and bounds ahead of where we were at their age in their faith. And so uh, we're extremely proud of them. And uh, I, just, I, I just don't want anybody to read between the lines and be like, oh, he's talking about his kids here, because I'm, I'm certainly not. Um, the other thing I would say is this. If, if you're a parent or if you ever plan to be a parent, you need to realize that one of the hardest and most important things for your life will be to stand in the role of that of an unwaveringly faithful person to your family. That will not always be easy. In fact, there will be times when it will seem impossible like it was for Job, but it's important that we as parents understand that, that we have to stand and we have to be unwavering in our faith to those God has put in our family. Um, at the core, I really believe this church, at the core of the evil that the devil desires to inflict on humanity, at the core of that is the destruction of family. He wants to destroy families. And we, we see this all over the place. We see this attack and this assault on families in every aspect of our culture and society. I'm not going to take a long time here to rail against this, but, but, but I just want to point out that we see it. We see it from the feminization of America and the, the demasculization of manhood in our culture over the last 50 years. We see it in, in the lie and literally, I believe, the demonic falsehood that is the LBGTQ movement that is now mainstream in our culture. And not just mainstream in our culture. There are mainstream denominations who claim to be Christians who have embraced and fully support that. And at the core of that movement is the destruction of family, the biblical family. We see it in the destruction of biblical gender roles in the home. Um, we see it in the weaponization of all forms of media, including social media, but all forms of media. We see it in the weaponization of the public school system to this end. The, the blessed and holy institution that the Bible calls family 
is under attack. And the devil is attempting to destroy it. Now, this should not surprise us because any student of Scripture can tell you, you can go back to the Garden of Eden and you can see what the devil attacked first. He attacked the family. He attacked Adam and Eve and their relationship to one another. That was the first thing that was destroyed after the fall. That's why they went to gather those leaves and cover themselves up, right? He was trying to bring separation between husband and wife, going after the family. And we see it consistently all through Scripture. He continues this, and he's going to continue it in our day, and it's probably not going to get any easier or any better. But Job... Job is, a, and is, is an example of somebody who is unwavering, standing in the gap for his family. He's unwavering in his faith to God, yes, and we are going to get to that. But today I want you to see how unwavering he was and how faithful he was to his family. We're going to pick up in verse 2 where we left off last week. But for the sake of context, I'm just going to start in verse 1. It says, there was a man in the country of Uz named Job. He was a man of complete integrity who feared God and turned away from evil. That's what we talked about last week. And then look at verse 2. He had seven sons and three daughters, ten kids. That's a lot of kids, y'all. His estate included 7,000 sheep and goats, 3,000 camels, 500 yoke of oxen, 500 female donkeys, and a very large number of servants. Job was the greatest man among all the people of the east. His sons used to take turns having banquets at their homes. They would send an invitation to their three sisters to eat and drink with them. Whenever a round of banqueting was over, Job would send for his children and purify them, rising early in the morning to offer burnt offerings for all of them. For Job thought, perhaps my children have sinned and curse God in their hearts. And it says this was Job's regular practice. The big idea for today is this. No matter what, no matter what, be faithful to your family. Last week, we really focused on the kind of man Job was, that he was a, a man of complete integrity, that he's a man who feared God, that he was a man who shunned and turned away from evil. Verse 3 takes it even further, builds Job up even more. It says, Job was the greatest man among all the people of the East. But it does not appear that Job's children are following in their father's footsteps when it comes to faith, does it? His children are clearly making different life choices than Job. His children clearly have not captured the essence and the heart of who Job is, and, and this has not been passed on to them yet. They, they are adults or at least living on their own at this point in their lives, and what we know from the text is this, they are partying it up. <laughs> they're drinking. It, it appears they're doing so in excess, getting drunk and doing things they probably shouldn't be doing. Their life choices seem very different from those of their father, don't they? And this is happening a lot. The, the part of the scripture where it says, whenever a round of banqueting was over, is very interesting in the Hebrew. People that are very, a lot smarter in Hebrew than me, there's different ideas of what this means. But the leading thought here, the leading idea is that, that a round of banqueting and indulgence on their part and the sin that accompanied it would have probably been seven parties. So, so this isn't just after every party, every now and then, uh, Job would do this. He's saying after every seven parties, after a round of banqueting, Job would gather the family together and he, he would do this for his family. He would stand in the gap for them. So basically after every seven parties, Job would call them together and he would make this effort with his kids, this effort of purification to offer sacrifices for them. Now Job, it doesn't appear, knows exactly what they're doing or what sins they've committed. Parents, you know, as your kids get older, you know less and less about what they're doing and where they're going and who they're doing it with and how they're doing it and what it is, right? 
That's the stage in life Job's in. He doesn't really know what's happening, but he knew they were not living a life of complete integrity. He knew they were not living a life of fearing God. He knew they were not living a life where they are turning away from evil like like he's doing. And, And my point is this, maybe you can relate to that, maybe you can't, maybe you will later on in life, but... We, we, we can all find ourselves in this situation where our children are not following the Lord with the same passion we are. Or maybe they just don't study the Word of God and love the Word of God the way you do, and you wish they would read more and pray more and do their devotions without you having to nag them, right? It, this doesn't mean your kids are bad people. This doesn't mean Job's kids are bad people. They just haven't risen to that level of intimate relationship with God that you have or that Job has in this case. This doesn't even have to be our children, though. This could be our spouses. Maybe you guys are on different spiritual levels for whatever reason. And and your spouse that you're praying for and longing for just hasn't quite gotten there yet. Or maybe it's your parents. This can happen as well. Maybe you came to, to faith and your parents have not come to faith. And you pray for them, and you witness to them, and you're trying to be good examples for them, but, but no matter how hard you try, they, they just, they're still not catching it. They're still not getting it. And, and you would long and love for them to come to know Jesus the way you know Jesus, but it just hasn't happened yet. Whatever the case, what we can see here in the life of Job is that he is an example of how we can all be faithful to our family when we find ourselves in that kind of situation, even if someone in the family is not as faithful as we are. There are three main things I want you to see and then a bunch of sub-things I want you to write down. We're going to move quick, okay? Number one, first main point is this. I want you to see Job's responsibility. Number one, I, I just want you to see that Job took responsibility for his family. That should not be lost on us that Job takes personal responsibility for his family. He is the priest of his family. He is the leader of his family. He is the spiritual head of his family and taking responsibility for that. And men, if I can, I want to just speak to you here and I want to encourage you. If you're a man, this is who God has called you and created you to be in your own family. As a man, you are called and commanded and created by God to do these three important things for your family. The next blanks, very quickly. You are called to lead them, you are called to love them, and you are called to long for them to know and love and serve God. We could take a lot of time on those points, and we could unpack those with Scripture, but they seem pretty self-evident to me. We're just going to touch on them quickly. I just want you to see how Job did it. In Job 1.5, it says, whenever a round of banqueting was over, Job would send for his children, he would purify them, and then rising early in the morning to offer burnt offerings for all of them. Job is clearly taking the lead in that process, is he not? Amen. He sent for his kids. He planned it. He prepared it. He made all the necessary preparations for this to happen. This man is leading his family well. Number two, he loved them. You can see that here in the text. He's doing all of this for them because he loves them. He cares about them. And number three, he is clearly longing for them to be right with the Lord. He's longing for them to make better life choices. And like so many of us, Job, he wants what's best for his kids, don't we all? We all want what's best for our kids. That's why we try. It's, it's why we lean into it. It's why we, we do the things that we do. And Job knows that, that what's best for his kids is that they would accept and believe and love God in the same kind of way he's doing it. He wants them to be blessed. He wants them to know the blessing of having that relationship with the Lord that they haven't gotten to yet. And in doing these three things for his family, we also see three other very important things. I want you to notice this. He took it seriously. This this is not an afterthought in Job's life. This isn't optional. This this wasn't something that Job just kind of stumbled into. You can, just in this very short verse, 
you can sense the great intentionality and purpose behind his leadership and his love and his longing for them to know the Lord. If you have a child or a spouse or a parent or a brother or a sister or a cousin or an aunt or an uncle or, or anyone else that you love and you would love for them and you long for them to, to know and experience the blessing of God like you've experienced it and have a relationship with the Lord like you have, then you're going to have to be serious about the way you're living your life. Job, Job didn't just hope the pastor would get to his kids one day. Job didn't just hope they would start going to church and, and one day it would all click and somebody else would make a difference in their life. He didn't just count on his friends doing it, and that's, a, that's good because you're going to find out Job, Job didn't have the best friends in the world. But he, he didn't just hope that his friends would do it or their, their peer groups would do it. He wasn't just content thinking that his kids might just one day discover this relationship themselves. It, it, it's easy for us as parents to say, well, they'll get it one day, just like I did. Now, we, we're going to have to be more intentional than that. that. That's the prayer and that's the hope, but what if they don't? We need to be serious about our responsibility as parents to be unwaveringly faithful to whoever it is we love and would long to see rise to a higher level in their spiritual relationship with the Lord. See, Job did what he could to lead them, to show them that he loved them, and to show them how much he longed for them to be in a right relationship with God. In the same way, we need to realize that, that being faithful to our families requires us to take spiritual things seriously. We should be serious about our faithfulness to the Lord. That, that starts with us, right? I often say, you got to get everything right in this little circle, right around you first. Before you go trying to get everything right with everybody else, you got to get stuff right in your world. you got to be serious about that. And then we've got to be serious about that next little circle around us, which is our family. We have to be serious about our faithfulness, and then we have to be serious about helping lead them and love them and longing for them to step into that faithfulness themselves. Number two, I want you to see this, and we can't miss this one. He acted sensibly. Sensibly. I don't think this is insignificant, y'all. Job, Job sent for his kids, and they respected him and loved him and trusted him enough to show up to take part in the process that they already knew their father was going to want them to go through. It doesn't take much of an imagination to believe that some of them on the way to their dad's house probably went, oh man, we got to go again. <laughs> Dad. <laughs> Dad and his sacrifices. <laughs> Dad and his God. He wants to purify us again. Ah, let's, I guess. Right? There's probably some smart aleck comments happening along the road as they're heading that way. But notice here, the implication in the text is the kids showed up. And you might be saying, well, yeah, look at all the camels and donkeys he owned, man. They got an inheritance to protect. Of course they're going to show up when dad calls. But listen, we've seen examples of, of kids of kings and queens leave it all and separate from their family over far less. Like, I don't think this is a, hey, we want to get the money when dad's gone kind of a thing. I think they really respected their dad. They loved their dad. They, they showed up because dad said, I need you to come to the house. And they knew why they were going by this point. This is a regular occurrence. This is happening a lot throughout their life. See, I, I think that's because Job, as a man, had a relationship not only with God, he had a relationship with his kids. And he did all of this in a very sensible way. I often think about Ephesians chapter 6, verse 4, where it says, Fathers, don't stir up or exasperate. Don't stir up in your children in anger, but bring them up in the instruction and the training of the Lord. And can I just tell you, that is a very fine line. There's a very fine line, amen, between stirring up anger and taking it too far and encouraging them and training them and instructing and disciplining them well 
insensibly. I'll be the first to say I've crossed over that line many times. My kids could give testimony, but we're not going to give them a mic today, okay? <laughs> but, but there's a lot of tension in this verse. There's a lot of tension in that aspect as a dad or a mom. But, but I think the, the overarching spirit there, even in Ephesians, is you've got to do this in a sensible way. You've got to do this in a way that, that doesn't destroy the child, doesn't destroy the relationship, doesn't, doesn't destroy whatever you have between you and your mom and dad, or whoever it is, because this doesn't have to be children, as we said at the beginning. And this is hard, and it definitely requires wisdom from God and wisdom from the Holy Spirit. But it appears to me that Job had somehow, as a dad, he had found that balance. And I believe we can find it and, and we can get there as well. But we've got to be sensible in our approach to this. If we take this to unsensible places, they're not going to show up anymore. They're not going to want to be any part of it. They're not going to want to have any part of our lives. And that's not good either, right? Look at this next one. He did it selflessly. Yeah, he was serious about it. He was sensible about it. But he's also selfless in the, in the act of doing it. In verse 5, it said he offered burnt offerings for all of them. Several of the commentaries that I read from people who are way smarter than I am, especially when it comes to Hebrew, they, they pointed out that this part of the text literally indicates that Job offered these sacrifices for each and every one of his ten kids individually. So, so the picture here is not just Job said, hey, everybody come to my house, we're, we're going to just do this sacrifice, and I'm going to sacrifice y'all, it's going to kind of be a general sacrifice for all of y'all. It appears in the text that, that this man made individual sacrifices for each of his kids. There's nothing in this for Job. Job's giving up his time to go through this great effort. He's giving up his livestock to do these sacrifices. He's giving up his energy to do this. He is the one who is selflessly making the effort on behalf of his family. And it's a beautiful picture of what it looks like to be faithful to your family no matter what. Moms, y'all are probably better at this than dads, but dads, we've got to be good at this too, right? We've got to learn to live selfless lives, to put ourselves in those places and those scenarios and those situations where we step into faithfulness and say, even if I've got to be completely selfless here, I'm, I'm going to do this. His children, Job's children, are not living faithfully to God, at least not at the level Job is, and not at the level he wants them to be, but Job is living faithfully to them. He's taking responsibility for it as the leader of his family. Next, I want you to see point number two. I want you to see Job's reasons. His reason for doing this is not a secret. It's not theologically insignificant, but, but it's also not hard to dissect. If you look at verse 5, it says, Whenever a round of banqueting was over, Job would send for his children and purify them, rising early in the morning to offer burnt offerings for all of them. And then look at what it says next. It says, For Job thought, perhaps my children have sinned, having cursed God in their hearts. Job was not naive. And Job was not so smitten with his kids that he couldn't see their faults. Job, and Job, catch this y'all, Job was not so afraid that everybody else in town was going to think less of his family because he's going through all this effort to purify them because they're sinning. This is the greatest man in the East. This is the man that everybody knows as being a man of character and integrity, has a heart for the Lord, and then his kids are out there partying it up, doing their thing, and then Job's having another one of those deals at his house where he's trying to get them right between them and God again. Job's like, I don't care. We're, we're just going to do this. I'm, I'm going to take responsibility for this because I have a great reason to do, do it. Job says there's a great possibility he doesn't know for sure. It says perhaps, right? There's, there's an uncertainty there, but he, he feels like there's a great possibility that his kids have sinned against the Lord that he loves. And there's even a possibility that they may have cursed God in their heart. 
And Job knows, somehow here, Job knows that he can't take responsibility for their sins, but he knew he could take responsibility for living faithfully to his family and doing whatever he could to show them a better way. I love how this one commentator said it. He said this, he said it was Job's way of reminding his children, mom and dad, have you ever done this? It was Job's way of reminding his children to do what they were doing in moderation, a gentle parental nudge in the direction of holy living. Because there comes a point in your life when that's about all you can do is nudge them, right? The right way and gently try to point them. And that's the stage these kids are in. And, and that's what Job is trying to do here. Again, we see this seriousness, this sensibility. We see this selflessness of a loving father. And his reasons are not complex. His, his reasons are not hard to understand. He's just doing his best as a dad to lead his kids into a loving and lasting relationship with God because he longs for them to know the Lord like he knows the Lord. Job wanted his kids to catch it. He wanted his kids to grab it. He wanted his kids to have it. He wanted his kids to know what he knew. Again, we, we see that he was a man who decided to be faithful to his family no matter what, no matter what people thought, no matter what it looked like, no matter how long it took, no matter what it cost him. He said, I'm going to be faithful here, and I have reasons to be. And then number three, I want you to see Job's regularity in this. Go back to verse 5. I want you to see how verse 5 ends. We won't read the whole thing. We just read it, but look at how it ends. This was Job's regular practice his regular practice one of the things most people don't know about the book of job is where it fits into the biblical timeline the biblical narrative in our bibles the book of job um, falls in between the book of esther and psalms near the middle of the old testament but in reality it's one of the oldest stories in the bible in the biblical timeline scholars place the story of job happening just after Genesis, that's right, Genesis chapter 11. It's one of the oldest stories in the Bible. The reason I share that with you is because I, I want you to see that Job lived in, in the Abrahamic age, era. There's no temple in Job's day. Job doesn't have the Ten Commandments. It hasn't happened yet. That's, that's way down the road. There's no Levitical law in place. This is literally just a faithful man doing his best to love and lead God as best he knows how and his family. To lead them to love and to know God. And, and he's doing that by offering burnt offerings and sacrifices to God as his regular practice. This, Job didn't just do this for his kids after a round of partying. This is his regular practice. This is what he does. Yes, he did it regularly for them, but he's also doing this regularly in his own life. He didn't just do this when the kids partied it up. He's doing this in his own life as well. He's, he's loving God and standing there faithfully with God through his own life. This is his spiritual lifestyle, if you will, if we want to modernize it. I would ask you this, moms and dads in particular, what does your regular spiritual lifestyle look like? What does what your regular spiritual practice look like in the Lord? And we can all do better. There's no judgment here. I've, I've got things in my own life that I need to do better at. But I, I just want you to kind of ponder that and process that. Like, like what, what, what does that look like to anybody who would look at it, especially people who live in the house with me? And you might have your own spiritual practices already, but if you don't, I want to just give you five good ones to start with. I'm not saying these are the only five. These aren't in any particular order. But these are five good ones to start with. If you want to create a regular lifestyle of spirituality in your life between you and God. And, and these are great for your family as well. Number one, I would tell you to regularly worship together. Regularly worship God together. Hebrews chapter 10, 24 through 25 says, And let us consider one another in order to provoke love and good works, not neglecting to gather together as some are in the habit of doing, but encouraging each other and all the more as you see the day approaching. 
being at church regularly is important. Being at church as much as you're able is important. Nobody's going to be here 52 Sundays out of the year. I, I get it. I'm not even here 52 Sundays out of the year. I'm not saying you have to be here every single Sunday. Some of you work shift work, so you can only come every other Sunday or every third Sunday or whatever it is. But, but there should be a regularity to what you're doing. In other words, you should be here when you can be here. You shouldn't just be like, ah, I don't know, game starts at noon, he's probably going to preach a long time, I, I think I'm not going to go today, right? Come to the early service if that's your problem. Right, you can figure out a way to be regular about it. And you should be there regularly as a family together. But let me also remind you, church, that this is not the only place you can worship God. And this is not the only place you should worship God. You can worship God together as a family outside of church. That's not an excuse to neglect going to church. It's not an excuse or reason to not go to church. But it's a reality of life, and we should be worshiping God together with our families, even when we're not at church. I just, I don't want you to think that church is the only place worship takes place. It shouldn't be. That shouldn't be the case. Whatever you do and however you do it, worship God together and do that regularly. Next, I would say this, regularly pray together. Again, there's multiple ways to do this. There's multiple ways this can happen. There's, there's so many different, very appropriate times and ways to pray together as a family. We're not going to go into all of those today. But, but I do just want you to see how important that is as a regular part of your lifestyle and spiritual practice as a family. 1 Thessalonians 5, 16, 17, and 18 describe some personal things for us, but these can also apply to our families. Rejoice always, pray con constantly, without ceasing, some translations say, and give thanks in everything, for this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. Th those are three very important things we can do together as a family, and at the core of that is prayer. Pray together as a family. Next, I would say this, regularly serve together. The New Testament is littered with verses about how we as disciples of Jesus are called to serve. We're not going to take time today to go into those. Again, this is very self-evident all through the Bible. This isn't a new concept we need to spend a lot of time unpacking. But we should be serving together, and we should be serving God any way we can. Again, not just here at church, but anywhere God calls us to serve. And don't forget, you can do this as a family. I love seeing families or parents and a child or parents and a couple of their, their kids. For example, we have, we have some moms and some dads who are taking their kids on mission trips this summer, serving together through, through the church, but going to Africa and to other places. Not the whole family, because that's sometimes logistically just not easy to do, but they're doing that as father and son, or mother and daughter, or mother and son. They're going out to serve together. That's beautiful. We see families serving together in children's church here at, here at um, our church, or, or even at the door, right? We, we, we see some of our dads with their little kids there who are helping pass out bulletins. They're serving together. There's a lot of ways to do this. This doesn't have to be complicated or hard, but but we should serve together as families. I know one of the things my kids love to do is help mom when she's teaching in children's church, serving alongside them. We, we need to serve together. There's a lot of ways to do it. There's many ways to do it, but just find a way to regularly serve together. It doesn't even have to be here at church. Maybe it's taking care of the widow across the street, and you and your family just kind of take that on you. Like, hey, we're going to mow her grass, and we're going to check on her, and we're going to invite her over to dinner, and that's what we're doing as a family to just serve somebody else. I don't want you to build this up into thinking it's all got to happen here. Certainly not, but there should be some regularity in your life where you're serving people outside of you and outside of your home together as a family. This next one is important, and this, this is maybe the most difficult of all of them, and, but I think this is really critical. You have to regularly sacrifice together. And mom and dad, you're going to have to use your spiritual judgment on this. You're going to have to ask the Lord, and this is going to look different as your kids are at different phases and ages. 
of their life, but there, there comes a point in time when your kids need to learn how to suffer and sacrifice things for God. And I'm not talking about sacrificing animals like Job did, okay? That's not, what we're, that's not what we're getting at. What I'm talking about is there comes a point in time in your kid's life, and again, wisdom is important here. You're going to have to lean into the Holy Spirit. You're going to have to lean into God for wisdom on this. But, but there comes a point in time where your kids have to learn that they're going to need to make personal sacrifices in their life to honor and serve God. If your family never sees you personally sacrificing or suffering in anything for the Lord, if you're never encouraging them to make sacrifices and and be willing to suffer for the Lord, can I just tell you they are probably not going to grow up to be fully devoted disciples of Jesus. Because at the heart of discipleship is submission and sacrifice. Listen to what Jesus said in Luke 14, 26 through 27. He says, If anyone comes to me and does not hate his own father and mother, wife and children, brothers and sisters, yes, even his own life, he's talking about sacrifice here, he cannot be my disciple. And then look at verse 27. Whoever does not bear his own cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. Submission and sacrifice is all over that. Submission and sacrifice is part of being a disciple. And sacrifice is important. And sometimes making sacrifices leads to some level of suffering in our life. And our kids and other people in our families need to understand and need to see and need to know that that's okay. That that's normal. That that's a part of living in a sinful world and serving a loving and a faithful God. And this last one is the easiest one of all. I'm going to end with the easiest one of all, but it's also the most dangerous one. I want to encourage you to regularly play together. It's okay to have fun. It's okay to go on vacations. It's great to go to the river or the beach or to go fishing. It's awesome. Go play games. Go watch sports. Get your season tickets. Throw the ball in the backyard. Kick the ball if that's your thing. Go hunting during hunting season. Rodeo if that's your thing. It's awesome. Play together. Make memories together as a family. That is a good, wise thing for families to do. Spend time together and have fun together. Here's the struggle. Here's the danger. The struggle is keeping that in balance because far too many families spend all of their time playing and no time praying or worshiping or serving or sacrificing together. And when we get that out of balance, it can become very dangerous very fast. So we have to use wisdom there. It's good to play. It's good to have fun together. It's good to allow us to just soak up the goodness of God and celebrate who he is and the ways he's blessed us but we can very quickly get that out of line and get that out of balance if we're not careful so we've got to guard that and we've got to be watchful over it again no matter what you do be faithful to your family i think that's really the lesson of job here he's faithful to his family you might be thinking well man preacher that sounds like a lot of work i'm not gonna lie to you If it was easy, everybody would be doing it. And obviously, everyone's not doing it, so obviously, you're right. It is hard. It's not easy. But it is worth it. Some of you might also be thinking, yeah, I think my kids are too far gone, man. They're way out of the house. They're they're way outside of, of my circle or that relationship's been destroyed or whatever it is. Can I just tell you, nobody's ever too far gone for the Lord. It's never too late to be faithful to your family. It's never, ever, ever too late to fight for your family. It's never, ever a waste of time to be faithful or to fight for your family. No matter what that situation looks like, no matter how devastating it's been, no matter how destroyed you think it is, can, can I just remind you we have a God who raised his son from the grave to redeem his people? Like, he's a God of miracles. 
Trust him with that and start being faithful now and do what you can now to lead, to love, to long for them. Do what you can now in a sensible fashion, in a serious way, to show them who God is in your life and let God do the rest. I want to close by reminding us all especially those of us who are thinking how hard this is going to be. (laughs) Let me remind you how faithful God has been to us. Because we're his children. We're his family. We're the heirs of his kingdom. We have been adopted into the family of God. Can I remind you that was not easy. He sacrificed his one and only son to make that happen for you and for me. I say that not to guilt you. I say that just to remind you that God's not asking you or I to do anything that he has not already done himself. He's not asking you or I to do anything that he hasn't already modeled for us. Because he is faithful to us as his family. And we're called to be faithful to our families as well. No matter what, be faithful. If you've never given your life to Christ, if you have have never been saved from your sins, I want you to know how faithful God is. I want you to know that he is faithful to forgive you this very day if you will repent, believe, and be saved. 1 John chapter 1, verses 8 through 10, listen to the faithfulness of God. If we say we have no sin, we are deceiving ourselves and the truth is not in us. Don't let that be you today. Verse 9, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and righteous to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we say we have not sinned, we make him a liar and his word is not in us. Don't be that one today. Be this one. Confess your sins. He's faithful and righteous to forgive you of your sins and to cleanse you from all unrighteousness this very hour if you will believe, if you will repent, if you will confess. He's faithful. He loves you. He cares about you. Let's pray. If that's you and you need the forgiveness and the love of God in your life, we invite you to accept it right now, right here, before we take the Lord's Supper together. I'm not going to ask you to raise a hand or stand up. Just pray right there where you are. Just say, Lord, it's me. I confess that I'm a sinner. I know that I've gone astray and messed things up. So I ask now by faith that you would come into my life and that you would change me. Lord, I ask by faith that you would forgive me, redeem me. I thank you for your grace, for your love, for your mercy. And for the example that you have set for me. And what it looks like to be faithful to your family. Father, we praise you and celebrate you for those who have just called on you and come to know you as their Lord and Savior. We ask that your blessing would fall like a heavy dew, like a heavy rain onto them in this very moment, just like it did that first Pentecost Sunday, Lord, that they would feel the power of the Holy Spirit welling up inside of them. Lord, we thank you for the gift of grace, the gift of love. Lord, we thank you for the model that Job was for us as we long to be that same kind of man or woman to our families today. And Lord, now as we approach your table and prepare to take the signs and symbols of your body, your flesh and your blood into our lives, Lord, I pray that we would never forget the great sacrifice you made for us on the cross. Lord, you are so good so faithful and so loving. We ask your blessing now on this time in Jesus' name.
Hey, this is Pastor Pete. Thanks so much for watching this sermon from Cowboy Fellowship. We hope you enjoy it. I want to ask you if you don't mind, be sure you hit the subscribe button, the like button, and then leave a comment, an encouraging word down below. All three of those things are so encouraging to us. They also help with the YouTube algorithm and help us as we're trying to get the good news out to the world. Thanks for watching this video. Thanks for being a part of our online family. We pray God blesses you today.